Hello, hello. Welcome for another episode of the Author Spotlight. Hey, it's the host with the most, your man, Darren M. Palmer. So excited to be with you, where I go behind the scenes with those who are authors who are just definitely crushing it, whether it's locally or globally. And I have definitely a change agent on the show today. I have Mr. Daniel Cribs. Before he comes on, I'm just going to share a little bit about him. Uh, he's an, uh, Daniel's an ordained minister, a minister for 27 years and a certified JMT, a John Maxwell team speaker, teacher, coach, and trainer. Over the years, he has committed himself in helping individual leadership teams and companies reach their greatest goals by teaching them to individually tap into their God-ordained potential. Through his lighthearted, passionate approach, Daniel confronts the issues of per personal development by showing through scripture that once one discovers their divine calling and purpose, fulfillment is achieved and success is obtained, believing that when you catch a glimpse of your potential, that's when passion is born. Daniel is married to his college sweetheart, Lydia, <clears throat> in Winnipeg, Canada, and is the father of three amazing young adults, Taylor, Jordan, and what is the last name? I don't want to mess it up with my Southern vernacular there. Yeah. Aaliyah. Aaliyah. Okay, I thought it was Aaliyah, but I didn't, I didn't want to go there. But welcome to the show. Thank, Thank you for coming on and uh, taking time out your schedule to be on the Author Spotlight. It's an honor to be here. Awesome, awesome. <clears throat> now, today I want to go straight into it. Um, why this book? Why Defining the Call? Because we know that you co-authored a book beforehand, but with this as your first solo project, why did you go with defining the call? You know, by reading your bio, we tell that you're well diverse in several different areas, but why defining the call as your first book? It was kind of a personal journey for me. Um, uh, like I said, I've been a pastor for 27 to 30 years and um, graduated from Bible school in 1991. <clears throat> the truth is, I think a lot of people wrestle with the calling. Am I called? What's a calling mean? I felt a calling in my life when I was uh, 16. And I share that in my story. I was on the verge of suicide. My dad committed suicide. And I just kind of felt that I was next. And um, all of a sudden, the, on, a, on, a, on a youth weekend at our church, uh, the Lord touched my life and um, told me I was called. Now, I had no idea what that meant. And being a very introverted young man, I, I had a bit of a stuttering problem. I was insecure. The idea of being called, you know, I had no idea what that meant. I didn't know who to talk to about it. And I talked to my peers about it, and they didn't know what it meant. And so how do you find this idea of calling when it, it's just a feeling in your, in your spirit, you know? So go back, go forward 20 20, you know, 26 years, 25 years, and I knew that the Lord was making a change in my life, and he basically, through a dream, told me to leave my church that I was in and also leave my denomination. And so I'm at a place where, am I still called? Am I still, you still have a purpose for my future? And by the way, I'm at work, so I can ignore, ignore the call. But, and so I... I uh, was wondering what in the world uh, the calling meant, even at that point in my life. And so I felt the Lord telling me one particular morning to, to basically take the step of faith and leave the church. And as I was doing that, I remember the morning I was doing that, I, I uh, was waving my wife off to work. I wasn't working at the time, and my kids are going off to school, and the Lord just said, it's time to write your book. And it was that very morning that I sat down and I began to write this book. And I think what it was doing was solidifying within me that I was still called, but I still had a calling on my life. Mm, I love that. I love it. Now, you know what day I'm listening to this story, man, it got, it has a plot. I know it's your life, but it got a plot of like a movie or something that I was, <laughs> I'm thinking about all the, you know, for those y'all to make sure that y'all get the book. Um, but at the same time, I'm just listening to that. I'm like, wow, man, that's amazing. You know, like I'm watching a Lifetime movie or something back in the day. You know? and so, uh, but for those who are listening and who are tuned in, I, I was thinking the same thing when I was, well, Daniel answered a question that I had because of the calling. Like, how do you handle if you're called? And I think he brought up some great points of you might ask your peers, 
But yes, he might have been, you know, younger at the time when he was asking those. But even if we're in adulthood or whatnot, even if you're in your 40s or 60s, still, who do you really have to talk to uh, when it comes to saying that you're called? And so when he's having this Samuel moment and he's hearing somebody calling him, you know, so, he, you know, he's trying to figure out what's going on. So I thank you, Daniel, for sharing that uh, with us. But it's one thing. It's one thing to know that, okay, I, I feel like I'm called to write a book or God has told me uh, to write a book. But how did you come over dealing with mindset or fear of, you know, because even though you had co-authored a book, you know, you could have got in a rut like some do. Well, I don't want to do a solo project, you know, and, you know, so how did you overcome <laughs> the difficulties of the mind and move forward with going forward and doing the book and being obedient to what God share it with you. I think it's important to speak forth your vision. You know, um, first of all, I had a, when I was pastoring full time, my secretary began to tell me, Pastor, Pastor, you have to write a book, and she didn't tell me the topic or anything like that. She just kept on telling me I got to write a book. And at that time, I knew the Lord was already speaking to me. To do something, but I kept on putting it off. My schedule was busy. I had stuff to do. I had to pastor a church, for goodness sake. And but she kept on, uh, I won't say bugging me, just challenging me to do this. And the Holy Spirit began to speak to my heart, and I couldn't, I couldn't avoid it any longer. And so, really, um, it was something that um, was birthed within me by the Holy Spirit. But when it, when, when that happens, you got to speak for, you got to speak forth your vision. You really do. You got to claim it as if it's already a reality. You got to begin to say, I'm now writing my book. Because when your spirit hears you, the devil also hears you as well. You see, a lot of times we pray against the devil when we pray in our mind. The devil can't read our mind, he's got to hear us. And so I, when you begin to say, I'm writing a book, you're telling the devil just to, to mind his own business and get out of your life, and you're going to do what God wants you to do and so you're reminding yourself you are reminding the enemy and you're speaking forth life in the situation and it's being birthed just like a beautiful flower is being birthed and as you're doing that you begin to tell other people what you're doing before it even begins to happen and then people begin to ask you hey how's that book coming along hey how's that book come along and then um I'll just share a little short story. I, as, I, as I told you, as, you, as I already said, I, I teach, teach John Maxwell on this side. And uh, in one of my classes, I told, I told my, my students to set forth a vision. If you've got something you've got to accomplish, speak it out and set some dates for it and celebrate the little victories every day. And one of my students knew that I was writing a book, and she said, she spoke up, says, well, what's the date for your uh, book? <laughs> And I said, well, you know what? I'm going to have it finished this year. And she said, oh, when? And I said, this year I'm going to finish my book. And, and uh, she kept on pressing me. I said, listen, December 31st, I'm going to be done with my book. And I, as I spoke forth that date, it was something that was solidified in my spirit. And on, on December 31st, New Year's Eve, while everybody was out, out celebrating, I was at home in my kitchen finishing the last pages of my book. And uh, unfortunately, I got a bit sick that evening, so I had to put it aside. But the next morning, I was up at 6 o'clock, and by 8 o'clock that morning, I finished the book. So I was about eight hours late on finishing my book. But it just shows you, you got to speak it out. you got to say, this is what's, what God's going to do. And it helps solidify the fact of what God is going to do in your life. I apologize for the phone. I, I can just let that go. So. Wow. I mean, I love what you just shared there, uh, Daniel. I mean, it's just amazing. You know, I started to pull out my checkbook, man, and sow a seed. I mean, you know, man, you started preaching good. I mean, the preacher came out of you, man. You know, so I, so I, I, so I, I started feeling it because that is so important. Uh, and, and, I, and that's what you're covering in the book as well. You're giving us tangible steps. So yeah. many people, they might just say something, but it's like, what does that mean? You're yeah. speaking a foreign language. I like to call it Christianese. You know, yeah. speaking Christianese and think everybody's supposed to know what you're talking about. But if I do, if I am called, what does that mean? When you're talking about doing the book, no, you start speaking it out loud. You have an I am behind it. Um, yeah. You know, you having others hold you accountable as well. Yeah. And another thing I want to share for our audience, you know, 
and, and Daniel did a great job of this, is the importance of being able to get positive feedback. Yeah. See, so many of us, we typically want to call somebody a hater because they're holding you accountable. That doesn't mean that they're a hater. There are haters out there, but someone who's giving you feedback or someone just asking you a question, that doesn't make them a hater. That means that they're just getting positive feedback. They're giving you feedback or they're just telling you, hey, you might want to tighten this up, whatever it may be. And that's what you want to do. And so that's what I love about the story with Daniel is that he could have been, whoa, you're, you're going against me? You got something to say against me? He could have had that, that, that pride of Saul, so to speak, get in the way where he yeah. couldn't stand hearing them say about how many Daniel slay, I mean, David slayed. And so I want us to understand that too, in your journey, if you're writing or if you're starting a business or if you're in marriage or rearing kids or whatever it may be, you have to be able to get feedback. Do you agree with that, Mr. Cribs? Yeah, positive feedback. One thing I teach in John Maxwell is you're, you're, you're only as strong as the closest five people around you. And you need to have constant positive feed, uh, feedback in your life that will speak into your vision, speak into your dreams. And if those closest to you are constantly discouraging you and saying, ah, oh, you're too, you're not smart enough to write a book or you can't accomplish that. You can't go into ministry. Only smart people go into ministry. You know, if, if you've got those kind of people in your life, you got to get rid of them or make them less of an influence. You may not be able to get rid of them because you're related to them, but make them less of an influence in your life and have people that will speak into your life and also hold you accountable to uh, what your goals are. Thank you so much for sharing that. And when we talk about goals, because we know that you were called to do this, you know, it was spoken into your spirit about this. Also, you went and got, you know, uh, you had accountability, you spoke it out and you got accountability as well. But I want to go a little bit deeper into this because with your schedule, now we heard about you being married. We know that you have been in ministry. We know that you do other things. You're doing John Maxwell. I know people are wondering how in the world did this guy, I'm trying to get a paragraph down. <laughs> I got one job or one responsibility and I'm having trouble creating content. How in the world did he create content for this? Could you give us some of the hacks, uh, what you were doing before the end of the year or during that time? Was it breaking it up in a certain amount of words? Was it getting up early? Was it recording it? Just share some of it, give us some insight on what you did to create content for the book. Well, regarding creating the content, basically I broke it down into uh, chapters, what I felt would be good chapters for the book. In the end, the chapters were a fair bit different than what I initially started with, but that's fine. Your book evolves over time. But you need to be, like I said, tell those closest to you what's going on, especially your family. If you're like myself, I got three young adults at home and my wife, and so they need to know what I'm, what I'm doing. And so they need to be on board with this. And so they need to respect my time and, and uh, times where I need to be alone and be quiet. And so my wife was really good with that. We set up an office upstairs where I could be by myself. And pretty well every evening, I set aside time that I was going to work on my book. And you really got to do that. Because if you just do it um, when you feel like it or when you feel inspired, it ain't going to happen. You know, sometimes I sat down looking at the page going, what in the world am I going to write? And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit just begins to give you the inspiration. And all of a sudden, you begin to say, I've been at this for two hours. I better go to bed now. You know, so you got to take those steps of faith. I, you know, it doesn't have to be every single day. For me, it was probably about five days a week where I actually was working on my book. And um, it's amazing after a period of time. Because at first, you start to think, how am I going to write a book? I mean, I can barely write, you know, two, three pages. But it's amazing as one thing leads to another. I, I already told you that once I got up to, uh, you know, 20,000 words, I was thinking, man, I better start, you know, focusing on the end because I'm, I'm having a hard time stopping this train, you know, because I had so much I wanted to write. And so at first you're like, how am I going to fill in these pages? And then after you get going, the inspiration begins to come. The storyline begins to come. Um, as you're reading other things, as you're, as you're, you know, just watching inspirational videos, thoughts come to your mind, as you're reading your devotionals, things will come, but just make sure you work at it pretty well every day, even if it's only half an hour, and celebrate that victory every day. Man, I, I worked on half an hour today, it inspires you tomorrow to do the same thing. 
I love that celebrate no small wins. Yeah. And, you know, that's that that's you know, that's imperative for those out there who are thinking about how am I gonna get this done? I know that yeah. Daniel is speaking your language, um, you know, because he's sharing with us how we all feel. You feel so small when you look at the the grand scheme of things or whatnot, and you see, man, I'm trying to do a book. And then most of us, when we think about a book, you might start thinking about, you know, Moby Dick or some of the classics or think about these huge books or uh, for those who might remember this, you know, might be dating some of us right now. But if you remember the encyclopedias or whatnot like that, those type of things before we had, you know, Google and Siri and all that and Alexa, you think about that in your mindset. So you have to, you know, rid yourself of some of those things as well and realize, hey, I'm going to have you know, a, a goal in mind. I'm going to do what I can. I'm going to be intentional on it. And I believe that what Mr. Cribb shared too, uh, and I don't want to leave this one out, the importance of not getting emotional with it. And what I mean by that is you can't just write when you feel like it. Yeah. yeah. It's just like working out or being married, uh, being married or, you know, raising kids. You just can't say, oh, well, you know, you know, I'm not, I see some shirts out, you know, I'm not going to adult today. You know, I cannot adult today or whatnot. I mean, but you can't do that when it comes to uh, content creation, even if it's just, I'm just going to write a sentence right now and then let that move forward into being a paragraph and even a few pages. At least you built up the habit, uh, those successful habits, and it'll be able to flow. Uh, you know, and I look at where you were too as well, where you're up to 20,000 words and the same person who was wondering like, how am I going to do anything with this manuscript? Because it wasn't even a manuscript yet to now all of a sudden, Whoa, I got 20,000 words. How can I bog it down a little bit or slow the tempo uh, to be able to put a cap and finish this thing off? So if Daniel can do it, you can too. Uh, but I just want to make sure that we're getting getting these these gems and, and, and gleaning from what this story is to implement in our own lives. And, you know, and since you, you know, that you got it done, and like that young lady that you had shared with that you was going to get the manuscript done, what has it meant to you knowing one thing you co-authored one book but what did it mean to you just as an author to know that, wow, with the help of the Lord, I was able to do this um, on a solo tip, so to speak. You know, could you speak into that a little bit, Daniel, on you accomplishing that goal uh, with you and God on this one? You know, it's interesting. Uh, I always grew up that, you know, it's always other people that write books, you know. It's always the smarter people or, you know, more more inspired people than myself, you know? And um, I think me working with that first book was a catalyst to this book. Uh, it helped to definitely help co-authoring with someone was something that was able to say, Hey, I kind of, I kind of like this, you know, and people responding, what they got out of the book was very humbling and, and, and inspiring for the next book. Um, even if I didn't do that book though, I, I, I really believe that, it, the timing was everything. I was definitely at the right time for this particular chapter. And I'm not trying to uh, talk on both sides of my mouth saying, wait for that big moment. But you know when the moment comes, because when the Lord says, now it's time to write. And you got to be sensitive to the Spirit to listen to Him. As I said, I stood there, basically an unemployed pastor for the first time in 26 years, 25 years, and just in the living room by myself and God just said, now it's time to write. If I would have just brushed it off and said, well, forget it. I'm just going to watch the news this morning or whatever. I could have missed that moment. But once you start, it's almost like um, something like exercise. You know, people who don't like to exercise, you know, so I'm, I'll wait till I feel like it, you know, and that, that, that feeling never comes. The truth is once you start, the adrenaline kicks in and you want to continue. And I personally never been one that wants to start something and then never finish it. Once I start something, I want to keep going until it's done. And, and, and so what I have found personally, once you start, once you commit yourself to it, and like I said, as you speak it out to people, you don't want to have those people come back to you and you're like, well, I've been busy. I haven't, you know, I haven't had the time to do it. You want to be able to say, hey, I just finished my second chapter. Hey, I just finished my third chapter. I'm on my way, you know. And what a wonderful moment when I was able to tell my John Maxwell students, hey, I, I, I reached the goal, man. I, I finished. And they're all 
they're all responding back on Facebook, hey, way to go. And what I did, I inspired them because I spoke forth my dream, which spoke forth towards their dream. Well, man, if Daniel can do it, maybe I can do my dream as well. Drop the mic. Mr. Chris done drop the mic. What we say in the States, he's dropped the mic. I mean, he's definitely dropped some value bombs on us. I mean, get your heart hat on. I, I want us to, to really pay attention. Let's, 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 let's dig a little bit deeper once again, because I'm thinking about what you shared about the importance of what it meant to those students as well. And it was great for you, personal, personally uh, accomplishing a, a huge goal like that, a hair audacious goal, so to speak. You know, I know it meant a lot, but for those who are listening, I share this in workshops and conferences that we have as well. It, it, this is what inspires me stories like with Daniels because you really don't get it because you're so caught up on, uh, ma you know, majoring on a minor and minoring on a major when you're trying to get started writing the book. You're looking at the time, you're looking at the financial part of it. But once you get it done and you accomplish that and you give labor, you give life to this book, the the ripple effect or the domino effect of positivity in lives just changed. Some that you know about, some that you will never know about on, on this side is something that allows for me to be inspired to continue to share and work with people because I'm seeing these stories. I'm at these book lunches. I'm talking to individuals like Daniel. And then, you know, what, it, what does it mean for that person to say, you know what, I'm going to push forward and go and get my master's degree now because of this. I, you know what, I'm going to, you know, apply for that position that's been there for a while, but I was, I had fear had crept in on me and I wouldn't, I wouldn't try it. That couple who thinking about, you know what, we're going to try it again on our marriage or whatnot, or someone who might've gave up on their health and you inspired them. So it's not just inspiring someone just to be able to do a book, even though that happens as well. It's yeah. the areas of their lives that they know they need improvement, but it's just like you doing what you need to do and you shining and being a light for God is allowed for that light to pass on over to them where it's able to illuminate through their lives as well. And so I just want you not to look past this. Oh, well, then you said something in the class was happy. No, it wasn't just rah-rah applause. He's causing them to say, okay, I want to set higher and bigger goals now. This guy's practicing what he's preaching, no pun intended. And that's what you want to get out of your own story in your own life. How can I improve? Who are you making better? Who's having a better salary? Who's paying more attention to their children when they're home now? Or who's able to better be have, have a better relationship with God? and have an eternal uh, foundation by knowing God for themselves by what you're doing. And so this is just not, you know, temporary stuff. A lot of this stuff that you're doing is infinite. I've been able to read over some of the content in the book and even chat with Mr. Cribs as well. This is a game changer and it's going to be able to help people and give insight. And he was obedient to it. So if it's one person or a million pe people, if God told him to do it and he was obedient, you know, he went to Nineveh, even though he might didn't want to, as Jonah would tell you. So, you know, Daniel, thank you so much for sharing all that great information. Do you have anywhere like website or any, anything like that where if people want to connect with you as far as training with the John Maxwell or speaking? Yeah, you to, if you go to DanielKrebs.net, so D-A-N-I-E-L-K-R-E-B-S.net. Okay. That's, that's my website. It's being adjusted a bit right now, adding the new book and all that kind of stuff. But uh, but you can find information about my ministry there. So awesome. um, I do online classes with John Maxwell, person to person classes, online coaching, and uh, pastoral counseling as well. So so it's uh, it's a new step. I just want to say, you know, don't be afraid. If 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 anybody any ministers are listening to me right now, don't be afraid to change. And I talk about this in the book as well, like. Sometimes we can get caught up in the rut of our calling that we've been called to a pastor. Uh, my calling hasn't changed. I'm still called. I'm actually not my, even though I may not be a full-time pastor any longer, God is, God is directing me in a new direction, but the calling's still there. Don't be afraid to make that change. Even if you're, you know, 40 or 52, like I am, you know, it doesn't, don't be afraid to make that change because God, God, the one who calls will also lead you as well. So. Wherever he gives you vision, he'll give you the provision, man. And I just want to just for those to know that. And, I, and just to piggyback off that, what Mr. Krebs is sharing with me personally, I've even seen that in my own life. And I, and I share that. I'm able to pastor and minister as well. And through what we call, quote unquote, 
and Christianese through the secular work that we do, yeah. we actually minister to more people yeah. than we do behind the walls or whatnot, but behind the you know the you know traditional church setting. Um, so to speak. And so when you share that, I just definitely want to say that because I know somebody out there, we do have pastors and other leaders who are listening to that, that, you know, don't let anybody box you in, you know, because wherever you are, it's holy ground. Wherever you're carrying God with you, the Holy Spirit is dwelling within you. So if it's at a gas station, uh, whether you're, you know, you're in corporate, you know, whether you're at your kid's soccer game, or whatnot, you know, there's still opportunity for you to be able to minister. So don't limit God, you know, by your little finite thinking to that this is the only way I can be used, or this is the only way I can be called. So I just want to want us to get that understanding. And thank you for sharing that and helping us think outside the box, Daniel, because I know some people think like, how could he be a pastor and he's doing stuff with John Maxwell? I, mean, I, I know, I already feel it in the spirit that somebody is going over that in their mind. You know, you know, that's sometimes what religion does to us. It'll, it'll cripple us in overthinking. Um, but, you know, you, you can be used in many ways. And, and could you speak to that before we close out on how you've been used in all these different areas that God has placed you in? Uh, well, the, wherever the Lord leads you, he will use you. Mm. And, and I, you know, it's just amazing to see. Like I, I'm, I'm sitting in my in my office right now. I have a secular job now. I have a managerial position, and I found even the the manager role I have as a pastor has helped me in this position here. You know, there's a lot of similarities. But marketplace evangelism is is a powerful tool that I have had no idea how much I longed to do it till I actually stepped out and did it. Wherever God puts you, he's going to use you. And uh, I've been ministering to my assistant, and I know we're living in a politically correct culture right now where people say, well, you can't share your faith. Well, you, you know, you can take the pastor out of the church, but you can't take the church out of the pastor. You know, it's, it's a, you know he's going to be, I'm going to be constantly sharing God's word no matter where I am. And I, I don't do it, do it aggressively. I do it respectfully and passively. Like this morning, I sent a a text message to my head office boss and encouraged her with a scripture. And she's not a believer and she couldn't say enough how much she appreciated that, you know? And so let God use you no matter what direction your future goes. And you will find yourself being so enriched because you find yourself, because you, I, you know, I went into ministry because I wanted to minister. And I found in ministry many times I got caught up in the politics of church gotten caught up in all the drama of church and, you know, what color drapes and carpet and what kind of renovations project we're involved in. And all those are good, but it wasn't my first love. My first love is to help other people. And so this book is really just that. It's helping other people find their calling. You know, what am I called to? What, you know, what does it mean to be called? And, and uh, I just wish I had a book like this when I was 20 years old. It definitely would have helped me focus as to where I'm going. I mean, I, that's powerful what you just shared there, Daniel. And I mean, there's so many out there. There's so many yeah. out there. And, this, and that's why this book is so powerful for those out there, because just so many people that are shackled, yeah. who know, who love God, who you know, know they're called the whole nine, because, and I'm just using this as an example, they've got religion instead of a relationship. Yeah. So like you brought up, and you know, for those, for those, let's look at it a little bit differently, because I don't want us to just totally feel like if you, you know, you think it's someone, if you're in sales and you were hired to do sales, the same thing that he made the uh, example of, 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 about the importance of, he wanted to pastor and minister to people. And he's caught up on things like the drapes, the carpet, uh, you know, what family or what deacon or elder who want to run the church, all that. Okay. The same thing is if you join, if you're in sales and you, your passion is sales, I mean, helping people, getting the right products and services to them. But then all of a sudden they're telling you, okay, well, you need to be a sales manager now. So now you're dealing with other attitudes, personalities. You will make your phone calls. You will follow up your clients or they're telling you to do more marketing on social media. Well, that's not what you was really called for. You wanted to interact with people and do what you're best at. And that's sales by knowing what the products and services are, make sure that you're servicing people the right way. And so whether it's in the ministry mindset far as being a pastor or if you're in sales or even if you're uh, if we got educators on here right now who are listening, 
then you dealing with all the drama with your superiors. And then if you have a student you're trying to help and you got to deal with their parents and the, the economy and all that, the school board stuff, the certification, standardized testing. So for those who are saying, hey, Darren, we don't, you know, we don't understand where y'all going with the past stuff. Th the pastor is just a part of it. But this is what we call life, what yeah. we're talking about, defining the call. So whether you are the educator, whether you are in sales, whether you are in pastor, uh, pastor, we're all dealing with this thing of people trying to box us in or we're being limited by others' thoughts and perspectives on what we should be doing and what the position we have, what it should consist of. So, man, Daniel, I thank you so much for coming on. I knew it was going to be a great episode. Uh, you know, you, you know, you didn't disappoint. Uh, but if, I want you to share it lastly, if you don't mind. Could you speak to that person out there, Daniel, who's thinking to themselves like, you know, man, I'm not, you know, I understand how Mr. Cribs did it. He got years. I mean, even though you had to start somewhere, somebody's still going to view you where you are now compared to where you started at. But they might think I'm not Daniel, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not, you know, Joel Osteen or, you know, Warren Buffett or, you know, Bill Gates. You know, why would someone want to hear my story? I know I have something that's innate that's calling me to do this. And I want to do it. I want to put it out there. But could you share with people that they don't have to be a big name? They don't have to live in Dubai or New York or L.A. or, you know, Montreal to be able to put a book out. Could you speak to that person about the importance of sharing their story with the world? Well, in my book, I mentioned three patriarchs in the Old Testament. I talk about uh, David, uh, Moses and Joseph and how even though Joseph, you could look at his family lineage, he had quite the family, didn't he? You know, you had Jacob, you know, and, you know, Abraham as his family. But when it comes to Moses, we don't know anything about Moses' family, really. We know his mother's name was Jochebed. We don't even know who his father really was. We know a little bit of his sister. And we know that he was raised in Egypt. And David, we know a bit of his family, but we don't know much detail. And when I was in college, I remember thinking about certain students and going, oh, man, they're going to go far because they're related to this person or that person. You know, they'll get the big churches. They'll get the big opportunities. I'm just a nobody, you know. And when I look at Scripture, God, he loves the nobodies, if you want to call us. You know, we're all, none of us are nobodies. But from the world's perspective, God used the foolish things to confound the wise. And the important things we all have a story to tell. You know, I, I didn't realize how powerful my story was until I actually stepped out in ministry and began to share it. I remember doing a funeral once, and um, as I, I, be, I you know, these, this one father passed away, he got killed in a car accident, and his two kids are in the front row. I spent the whole time talking to his kids in the funeral. I ignored the entire audience, but I talked to his kids. And in the back, the funeral director, her tears are running down her face, and she's trying to wipe them with her Kleenex and and she came up to me afterwards. Now this is the director. She's seen hundreds of funerals. And and she said, I've never heard a funeral service like that in my entire life. Now I'm not here to, to boast about how I do funeral services. What I want to say is is the impact I made because of my personal testimony. Every one of us has a testimony. And you might say, well I don't have a testimony. It's your story. And it's his story in you. And so let that story be told. And there's, it's always going to impact somebody. And no matter who you are, if you've got a story to tell, which you do, you will impact somebody. And don't limit your life. Don't limit your experiences. Everything you've gone through, you know, is, is part of your testimony. The, the, the question is, how do you handle that situation? You know, don't waste the opportunity of a bad experience. Take that bad experience and use it for your testimony of God will use that. In my book, I mentioned, I, and I mentioned to my congregations many times, I said, stop asking God why and, ask, and start asking him how. A lot of times we say, God, why, why, why? But start saying, God, how can I take this pain, this situation, and use it for your glory? And when you use it for your testimony, you will touch lives. And when you put it down on paper, people, people want to read stories that they relate to. You know what I'm saying? They want to hear a story that, man, this guy, this guy, is, he's, he's speaking my language. You know, he's, he's saying what I went through. And this is where he's at today. Man, I, I can do that too. You know, that's why it's so powerful to share your, your testimony. No matter who you are, no matter what your background, you got a story to tell. Man, on that note, 
if you didn't get nothing out of this, shame on you. Because, I mean, it was some nuggets definitely given here today. I mean, how to just to live your life, like I, like I shared earlier. Whether you're in corporate, whether you're, you know, if you're in sales, you're educated, it doesn't matter what walk of life you're in ministry. Definitely, there's some great takeaways from this episode. That's why we have it nonchalant behind the scenes. You know, we want it like that. Hey, you're in the office. It, it, you know, it's real what you're doing here. And I thank you for stepping out and sharing this because it's something that we know is going on. But so many of us, you know, we kind of hide behind the veil, uh, whether it's, um, the denomination or the fear or the positions and all this other stuff. We don't want it. We want to fit in with everyone. So if someone's standing out saying something like this, even though we're dealing with it and experiencing it, experience, experiencing it, we're, you know, we don't want to talk about it. And so I'm, I'm grateful for you letting God use you and create that dialogue of giving those who don't have to think that they're crazy or be even suicidal. I just, you know, suicide rate is, high on certain pastors or whatnot too, because they're dealing with this same kind of stuff, but it's really no outlet and everybody got just, I call it church it up and that like we all got it together. Everything's perfect. Everybody's blessed and ain't nothing ever going on. And then somebody's committing suicide, you know, saying someone's divorced, you know, the kids don't went all crazy on meth and, and nobody can't talk to anyone. And that's not how it's supposed to be. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Krebs for coming on. I really appreciate it. Fair enough. All right. All right. Hey, until next time, thank you for tuning in. For those who lasted this long, we will have more information in the show notes, how you'll be able to get a copy of the book, how you can be able to connect and uh, even do coaching or see what other things that he have on leadership that he can provide you with, or even might even come to your church and do a service. I don't know. You got to ask him and his wife about that. I can't get you on that. But until next time, remember, this is the year for your new book. If you won't change, be the change. Until next time, be blessed.